see the uh, construction is coming right along. Completely did the floors outside. Don't they look great? So we're going to ask you when you come in just to leave your shoes outside. Um, money looking up your family tree. Just go into politics, your opponent will do it for you. <laughs> Sometimes it's so obscure, you know, when uh, you have a, a, a preacher that preaches on one of the minor prophets and, you know, you, you realize that, you know, how many people really just kind of skip over those when you, you find people that are looking for those things and if you've got a concordance, you're going to the back to see what page it's on. But um, the Lord has really been speaking to me on the prophetic of the season and I want to share my heart with you on that. And so, you know, for the next uh, few weeks, we just want to... Uh, just stay where we are with the theme of the prophetic. And this morning specifically, I want to speak to you on the character in prophetic ministry. The character in prophetic ministry. And if you uh, have your Bibles open to 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 5, reading down to verse 9, it says... But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, underline that word in your Bible, highlight it, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Bow your heads with me. Father, I just thank you this morning. That your word is right here. The word in the flesh is Jesus Christ. And Jesus, you are right here this morning. And I pray, Father, that as we discuss these things, that you would give us revelation, give us wisdom, and wisdom 
in the knowledge of God. I pray that, Lord, as we speak, that you will speak through us and open up our spiritual hearing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, last week we spoke a little bit about the prophetic anointing over the church, especially evident in the generation of the Lord's return. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul says this, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. And he goes on then to list the dysfunctions and sins of a rebellious generation and what it looks like. And then in Matthew chapter 24 and Luke chapter 21, Jesus himself gives us an outline of the signs that will be evident on the earth and in the heavens just prior to his return in the end time generation. And then he says this in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 34. He says, assuredly, when Jesus says assuredly, what, we, what he's saying is pay attention. Because I'm giving you something that is about to change your life. That you should know emphatically that what I'm about to tell you is actually emphatically going to come to pass. It is, he's emphasizing that emphatic nature of that word. He's saying, assuredly, I say to you what? This generation will, be, will by no means pass away till all these things take place. What Jesus is saying in this verse is that everything that he has outlined in Matthew chapter 24, everything that he outlines in Luke chapter 24 concerning the end times generation, everything, that one iota will fail, but heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall stand forever ever, says the Lord. And as the Lord outlines these things, you know, it may be frightening if you don't know the Lord, if you're not sure about things in your life, but Jesus is saying these things are going to come to pass, but be true to know that my heart, my life, that, that the Holy Spirit, that my presence will be with you as you trust in me. What are we seeing taking place today that Jesus was talking about and even Paul outlined in that 2 Timothy chapter 3? Well, they're speaking about wars and rumors of wars, cosmic phenomena and cataclysmic climate changes, strife within relationships causing hatred, bitterness, divorce, and even murders, economic turmoil within world markets, human suffering to the vilest levels due to poverty, hunger, disease, and racial persecution, a generation of faceless identity exposed through confusion and the rebellion of cross gender, homosexual, lesbian, and adulterous lifestyles that have been culturally accepted as the norm. If you go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 21, Jesus is outlining these things. The Holy Spirit through Paul is outlining these things. And if you were to pick up a paper today, this morning, or turn on CNN, BC, uh, CNN, Fox News, you will think that you are in that place looking forward into what Jesus is doing right now and what the world is, is doing right now and what Jesus is trying to express to us. We are living in the generation that may very well usher in the return of Jesus and his kingdom on the earth. And as the bride of Christ, we need to be vigilant. Everybody say the word vigilant. Come on, we need to be vigilant, we need to be astute, we need to be looking, we need to be ready and listening to what God is doing and what the Spirit is saying in this hour. Jesus says in Luke chapter 21 and verse 9, he says, but when you hear of these things, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass. Everything that God says comes to pass, amen? The word of the Lord tells us that when God speaks, he sends out his word. It never returns to him void. It never comes back to him saying it wasn't accomplished. So as the Lord is speaking, he's saying assuredly, he's saying pay attention. And then he says, don't be, don't be terrified of these things. I've told you about them. They're going to come to pass. The theme of 
the book of Revelation is not just about judgment, but it's about revival coming to the earth through the church because the season of the greatest attack that the enemy will launch against the church in the final days, the Holy Spirit will at the same time release the greatest revival the world has ever witnessed through the bride who yearns and beckons for the bridegroom to come. Remember last week we were saying that the book of Revelation actually closes with this song, with the spirit that is calling for the bridegroom to come, to come Lord Jesus. And the bride is answering the spirit and saying, come Lord Jesus. When those two begin together, that's what revival is about. When Jesus left the earth, the Holy Spirit was crying out, Jesus come, Jesus come. The moment that Jesus left, the Holy Spirit already began the song. The, the chorus is joined by the bride as we begin to pray. And as we pray for the Lord to come and that chorus joins together, revival will sweep over the earth and the Holy Spirit will bring in mass salvations. He will do great signs through the church as we rise up in the power of God and calling for the bridegroom, yearning for the bridegroom to return with his judgment over the earth. Revival will not only sustain the church during the darkest period known to man, but will empower the people of God with great boldness to preach the gospel in a powerful prophetic anointing accompanied through signs and wonders that will manifest the power of God over evil. Listen, throughout the tribulation period, the church will not retreat. Somebody say amen. We're not hiding. We're not looking for cover. But rather the church will advance. How will it advance? Through the power of the Holy Spirit and with the boldness of the gospel upon our lips. Listen, in the time of the worst persecution known to the church back in the early days in the early church, when these men and women were thrown to wild animals and torn apart, when they were being executed because they, pro they proclaimed and declared the name of Jesus over their lives, the word of the Lord spread quickly into Judea, into Samaria, into Jerusalem. The Lord sent them out. Listen, the, the, the more the persecutions, the more that they left their comfort zones of Jerusalem and they went out to the other city. That's what Jesus said before he left the earth when he he said, you will proclaim my name in, in, in all of Judea, in all of Samaria, and then in the outskirts of Jerusalem. With the, with the time in which the persecution is the greatest, the church rises up through the power of the Holy Spirit. When Listen, when things aren't bothering us, when things, you know, are cooler and we're making a little bit of money and things are comfortable, there's air conditioning in the building, we can sing all the nice songs, we become lax and we lose foresight of what God wants to do. But sometimes a little persecution comes in and things begin to rise up. We begin to call upon the name of the Lord. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Listen to me, church. As, uh, you know, as we're seeing all these things uh, on the outside, this is the time for the church to rise up. We rise up. We rise up. Revival is being poured out even as we speak into this time. The Joel chapter 2 revival and prophetic anointing has already been released over the lands. Sometimes America might be one of the last to receive it because we're a little bit too comfortable. But we see the word of the Lord going forth. And we see the, the, the things that God is producing. Listen, don't believe all this stuff that we hear so too many times on the news. That, you know, about, you know, the Muslim nations and they're so far gone. And, and the Lord is revealing himself to people of all over the lands. Every nation, every tribe. Pastor Ray that has come here so many times had a ministry out in Pakistan and among the Muslim nations. And he said that the, Jesus himself, there were testimonies of Jesus himself would appear to Muslim people in their sleep and reveal himself as Jesus and Lord and they would give their lives. There wasn't any great preaching or even an altar call of great revival services, but the Lord himself, listen, when the Lord reveals himself, when you have an encounter with God, something happens. 
And as the church of Jesus Christ, we want that encounter with God. We want that encounter with God. It's not just a past experience of what God did years ago, but what God is doing today with the plan and the vision and the dreams that God wants to instill in the church today. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, he says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. What has to happen first? There has to be a preaching of the gospel to all the nations. Just lucky in the era of technology that we're in, that you can pick up an instrument of any kind and you can speak to people all over the world. The Holy Spirit orchestrated the way communication has advanced because Jesus said, This gospel will be preached into all the world yes. and then the end will come. In other words, and then we will see the, judge, the, uh, the righteous judgment of Jesus over the earth. The Lord in his mercy is releasing revelation knowledge through the prophetic that will empower the people of God with wisdom, direction, and insight into the counsel of his will. Come on. We need direction. We need wisdom. We need uh, insight into the counsel of God's will so that we're not just doing things on a whim and eventually they become fleshly things with good intentions, but it becomes a fleshly ministry, a fleshly thing in order just to group people together. But God is looking for people that will pour out their hearts before him and gain knowledge of his heart, gain knowledge of his will. And we as then, as the people of God, have something to offer to a world that is seeking. The prophetic in biblical times was limited to a few men and women whom the Holy Spirit used to release the knowledge and the heart of the Father to his people. The prophetic voice was the source of communication and often the only source of communication that God used to speak to the people. But then in Acts chapter 2, a new covenant was put into place when the Holy Spirit fell upon the church and lives in the believer. Listen, we become the prophetic voice of the Holy Spirit. You and I become the prophetic voice of the Holy Spirit. When we come to salvation, the Holy Spirit falls upon us. We become the prophetic voice of what God wants to communicate. He wants to communicate into, the, into, into society. He wants to communicate into our workplaces. He wants to communicate to, to those that, 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 that are able to worship together. We communicate with one another because what? The, the same Holy Spirit lives and works within us. He's the same Holy Spirit that worked through the Old Testament. The same Holy Spirit that fell upon Jesus at his baptism and accompanied him through the earthly ministry. He's the same Holy Spirit that fell on the disciples in the upper room. The same Holy Spirit that worked signs and wonders in power through the early church believers because he's the same Holy Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead and he dwells in you and he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you power in your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. He's the same Holy Spirit that wants to empower us uh, to take the gospel to each end of the world. That's what the prophetic anointing is. We've confused what prophecy is. Yes, there are special gifts of prophecy that Paul outlines that are giving to the, the certain members of the church community, but each one of us has a prophetic anointing. Oh man, that was weak. Each one of us has a prophetic anointing. Now the question is, what are we doing with our prophetic calling on our lives? What is the Holy Spirit able to release in us and then through us in that anointing? The Holy Spirit came to empower the church in the prophetic anointing that we can face the world, 
that, that we face, a world that is wide in confusion because we are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. We will discern truth from evil, stand against injustice on the earth, and proclaim the gospel in power. And we will love each other in the same intensity that Christ has loved us. This is what we have called to do. This is the prophetic anointing that God has placed on each one of us. Reinhard Bonnke that said, the less Holy Spirit we have, the more cake and coffee we have to put out in order to do church. If all church is, is about, you know, greeting each other, we've lost the vision of Jesus. Because every time someone encountered the Lord, every time someone encountered the Lord, they had to make a decision of yes or no. There was no, I'll wait, that was a no. It was either acceptance or rejection. When we come to the Lord and we have a word of knowledge within us, the Holy Spirit within us, that as we're declaring his name, whether it's the way we work or the way we love or the way we go about things, that we are declaring that Jesus is Lord and someone will need to make a decision on how we go about things. Hello? Excellence is so important among the people of God, that we're not just doing something for the sake of filling a schedule or doing something just for the sake of getting it done, but we are doing it as unto the Lord. We are doing it as the Lord is looking down on us and has given us a responsibility. And so as we love each other, we're doing it as unto the Lord. As we're, we're, we're ministering to each other, we do it as unto the Lord. As we're, we're working even with our families and providing for our families, we do it as unto the Lord. Listen, as we pray, we do it as unto the Lord. As we sing, we do it as unto the Lord. As we're reading the word of God, even in our devotion, time at home. We do it as unto the Lord, not just as something that has to be done so we can put a check mark and say that it was done. That's the prophetic ministry that the Lord has given. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 3, it says that they spoke boldly in the name of Jesus. Look at this. It says, who bore, who bore it? Jesus, who bore witness to his word. What did he do? They were declaring the word in the name of Jesus. And the Lord was listening. Everybody say, the Lord is listening. The Lord is listening. And the Lord himself bore witness to what? His word that was being spoken. And then the verse goes on to say, and he accompanied them with signs and wonders and miracles. You know that God wants to manifest his glory? Not that we receive the glory. You know what the problem is so often, especially in our culture, is that we're constantly looking for glory. We're constantly looking for the spotlight to be on us. I was uh, talking to Jeff. Can I share this, Jeff? Jeff got a great promotion at work. Yay! Come on. But as I was talking to him, he said something that really resonated with me. As he's talking about this, he said, the Lord did this for his glory. And you know what? The Lord places people that are filled with the knowledge of God and humility to bring, for the sole purpose of bringing glory to Jesus Christ. He does this, and he places them in higher positions. Remember when Jesus was talking about, you know, those that go to the feast and they go take the first seat? He says, you don't want to do that because if the owner of the feast comes and taps you on the shoulder in front of all your friends and says, you've got to go back, it's going to be pretty shameful. Why don't you go back and have the, the, the owner of the feast come, tap you on the shoulder and say, come higher. The Lord heard that they were talking, that they were speaking. 
Jesus is listening, how we're projecting who we are and what we're doing, how we go about things, whether or not we're just slopping together a church service, whether or not we're just, you know, going to work, oh, man, I got to work. I, I come across people all the time, oh, man, I got to go to work. What's the alternative? When Adam sinned, what did Jesus say? With the sweat of your bride, you're going, to turn, you're going to till this ground. And we're going to work until we get to heaven. Then you can party. <laughs> Preaching of the gospel is a company, it's a manifestation. God is present, the Holy Spirit manifests itself. When God is present, the Holy Spirit will manifest itself. I always say, if you bring a, a baby into a, a quiet room, you will know the baby's there. Our taxes. Hello? We need to preach the word. We need to preach the word. And when, not the word, the word. And when we preach the word, the Holy Spirit is listening. Jesus is listening. And the Bible says he accompanies him with signs and wonders. In order to be a light, break the spiritual darkness, we must train our ear to what the Spirit is saying. And in the process, our character must be pure to reflect holiness. So that our testimony is not tainted with compromise. The prophetic is literally the Holy Spirit working through weak and broken vessels to reveal Jesus and the glory of God. Did you get that? The prophetic is literally the Holy Spirit working through weak and broken vessels to reveal Jesus and the glory of God. Prophets and prophetic people must walk in love, humility, and purity. So what does that mean? Whenever we talk about character, we are referring to our personality, to our attitude, to our behavior patterns. Listen, the one thing that is worse than a false prophet is a stupid prophet that lives in ignorance and compromise. Come on. A false prophet is looking for his own glory, and he's speaking lies. But a stupid prophet doesn't know what God is saying but tries to change the world. Amen? Come on. You know what I'm talking about. People who are trying to give advice and they have no idea what God is saying. And they come into your life and they say, well, you know, God told me to tell you this. I'll wait for the Lord to tell me. But if I know that there is a prophetic utterance over your life, if I know that your heart, your life is sold out, in the presence of God, and you're listening to what God is saying, if you come to me and say, I believe the Lord has said something to me for you, I'm going to listen, because I want to hear what God is saying. I might have missed something. God does speak through different things. Listen, in the Old Testament, he spoke through a mule. He can speak through anything and anyone. But we also need to discern the voice of the Lord. And so there is a training period in the prophetic ministry. Doctrine, gifting, character, all work together. The call to the prophetic ministry requires a process of maturing. In the Old Testament, we often read of the school of the prophets, an instructional place for young men to train their ear and to hear from God and then be released to minister to the people. That's what the Holy Spirit came to do in us. Prophets are called, trained, and commissioned. Everybody say this with me. Prophets are called, trained, and commissioned. 
What does a prophet do? How does a prophet train? He, he's called. He hears the voice of God upon his life. He's trained. He gets into the word of God. He, he gets into his, he, he, he exercises his prayer life. And then he is commissioned to go out and to speak what God is saying. We are to give all diligence to developing our character. Our character will determine the level of revelation and the power of the Lord that, will, that he has entrusted to us. Development of character gives you the capacity to carry the authority of the kingdom. Development of character gives you the capacity to carry the authority of the kingdom. And so the Bible says, for this reason, giving all diligence. You know what it's saying there? Give it your full attention. Giving all diligence. He says, add to faith. Add to to faith. I'm almost done here, but let me ask this question. Why do you add things? Think about this. Come on. Why do you put a little basil in the, in the sauce, ladies? Why do you put water in a plant? You add because something's missing. You add because something's, everybody's saying you add because something's missing. He's saying add to your faith, virtue, knowledge. You know what he's saying there? He's saying your faith doesn't automatically come with virtue and knowledge. Whoa. Your faith, your, Jesus, when you're born, gives you the faith of a mustard seed. You already have that faith. Hello? Don't go looking for anybody else's mustard seed. That's the problem today. We run from this person to that person to that person to get the mustard seed, to get the faith. Your faith is mature. He says, add to your faith. You've got the mustard seed. Now let it produce. Put it to work. Let it bear fruit in your life. He's saying, to knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. If you're missing this, add it to your faith. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. To brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. These verses that, that mention virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity, which is love. Notice that knowledge is included. We need knowledge. Everybody say, I need knowledge. We need knowledge. Or else we become stupid prophets. We're talking about stuff we don't know anything about, and we end up making a mess out of people's lives, and, and we bring disgrace to what God wants to say. Ignorance can be a character issue. When the prophetic is genuine, the prophet should have knowledge, especially the knowledge of the word of God. Secondly, notice that he who lacks these things, the Bible says in that verse 9, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness. Lack of character development will result in blindness. There is no way that you can be an effective in the prophetic ministry with blindness in your life. Often the reason that the Holy Spirit doesn't work through the prophetic in a person's life is because of blindness due to the lack of the word of God that produces divine knowledge. I'm going to close here. We've heard what God wants to say. Stand with me. The Holy Spirit is releasing revival. I'm going to ask that every head bowed, every eye closed. He's releasing revival in our generation over the earth. He wants to release a prophetic anointing over this house. He's calling out men and women, young and old, with a Joel 2 anointing to dream God's dream and cast new vision to preach the gospel with boldness and power, accompanied with signs and wonders that this place will reflect as Jesus prayed on earth as it is in heaven. The Lord will do this. You get.
get to decide what your role will be. If you're going to be a spectator, to just take in something and then go off on your merry way, or we're allowing the Word of God to change us. That we are not just the prophets in the church place, in the area of the cinder block walls, but we're a prophetic voice to the nations. God is calling us. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and 16, the Lord gave me this. He's saying, for now I have chosen and sacrificed this house that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Father, I just pray right now that we're not taking lightly the return of Jesus, but Lord, that we have our ear pressed to your heart God, that we will know what the Spirit is saying in this hour. Cleanse us, Lord, of all the rubbish, the things that are just taking up space. Father, clear our characters, our, our, our calendars of the cares of life that are holding us back to revive, from revival. I pray, Lord God, that in this season, you will pour out revival over the land. That, God, that this country will hear the voice of the Lord and that, Lord, we will come back to the original calling of prayer and building up the word of the Lord in our lives. That legislation that we pass will honor you and reflect the living God. I pray, Lord God, for the, for, for the cities, Lord God, that as we, we cooperate together, we're not just separate little cities here and there, but God, we are united in the word of the Lord and in the power of the Holy Spirit that, Lord, signs and wonders will break out all over this country in every city, in every township. Father, I pray, Lord, in every city council that you will baptize with the Holy Spirit and there will be a prophetic anointing, God, over the governments on the federal level, on the local level. God, I pray that revival will start in the church and will spread out. God, I pray uh, that we will take seriously our prayer time, uh, that we will take seriously the word of God as we're reading, and that as you reveal things to us, Lord, uh, that we will by faith uh, act them out. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that, Lord, you will raise up a prophetic voice in this house among every individual, Lord. That you will give us the diversities of the, of the gifts of the Spirit. Not, Lord, that we will bring honor and glory to ourselves, but to your name. Father, we thank you. We love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.